So I realized uh, I'm getting towards the end of the day, and I said, let's try and push it through. Um, so I appreciate everyone who's still here. So disrupting the kill chain. Um, I started talking about kill chain and, and Windows defense earlier this year. Um, so the talk that you see today is based off another talk that I did at Troopers and at Confidence, um, where I spoke about the defenses that Windows 10 offers natively out of the box, right? So I said, okay, what was my problem statement? I said, let's start looking at what Windows 10 and the evolution of Windows 10 has brought to the table and what Microsoft has brought to the table in terms of its security offerings. So if you heard Harun Mir's talk this morning, he said, off after CMS, one of the worst softwares that exist out there is security software, right? And it's not wrong. You start to realize once you start solving point solutions for point problems, you ended up with a bloated endpoint space, right? So if you look at any of your endpoint spaces today, what do I mean by endpoint spaces? You have a Windows 10, you have a Windows 7 machine in your network. It's running some sort of a logging agent. It's running some sort of an antivirus agent. If you're into forensics, you're running EDR of some sort. And to top it all off, your IT folks are running some sort of a telemetry agent, which is like SECM to push patches and configure management, right? And so you end up with a bloated endpoint space. Why is that relevant to us from security? A bloated endpoint space means that your attack surface is increasingly larger than what it was, right? So Windows ships out of the box, you have a feature set, and then you go and install more stuff on it, and that feature set expands, right? So that's, that's why it's relevant. So, so that's where the talk is coming from. So when you listen to it, try and refer back and try and map back to why we decided to do this, right? Um, so that's that. We will start by talking a little bit about the MITRE attack framework and the Lockheed Martin kill chain. Why is this relevant to us? Because I'm a defender, right? That's what I do on a 24 by 7 basis. That's my day job. That's my night job, right? And a defender is trying to find the best way to make a manageable, repeatable model for defense, right? So attackers have attacker methodologies. Your pen testers have pen tester methodologies. What do defenders have, right? So defenders are essentially looking at ways where they can repeat the sequence of defense mechanisms that they can deploy, right? So we look at attack, and then we talk about the kill chain. Uh, Windows 10, I spoke to you about already. And then at the end of the talk, right, we start to talk about what is our end objective, right? We're trying to slow the attacker down. And why is that important to us? It is because we want to become an increasingly difficult target. Yeah? It weighs in, right? Because imagine the value of the information you hold is significant enough that the attacker might deploy a nation state adversary or somebody to come after you. But if the margin to cross and enter your network starts to rise, the attacker starts to realize that their infiltration is becoming more expensive, right? So we'll talk about why these things are important. So a little bit about myself. I've, um, I've been doing security now for about 18 years, although I look very young. Um, I started off early, and I've been in security for a long time, right? So I, I did very little of, of IT. I started off in networks, a little bit of programming, and then jumped straight into security back in the CEH days. <clears throat> yeah. Um, in terms of verticals, I've done pharma, I've done retail, and uh, most recently I do aviation now. So look out for a few interesting things coming out of the pipeline in terms of avionics and IFE in my talks next year. So, what is in this talk? How do adversaries behave, right? So, my day job is defense, primarily. I look at how adversaries behave on the network, how red teamers behave on the network. You heard Nikhil Mithil's talk a little bit before this. He spoke about what is he doing as a blue teamer, a newly built blue teamer. Um, so, I'll talk more from my experience of what I've seen red teamers do on the networks, what attackers do, and then some of the nation states, right? The next item is really, how do you make their inclusion cost prohibitive? And this is the value of the information that Haroon spoke about this morning, right? He says, if the cost, and an attacker knows the cost of the infiltration, right? By all means, they always are holding back the ODAs for a much more competent adversary. They're also trying to determine what is the lowest threshold to cross in an attempt to get into your network. So what is the cost to an adversary? How do we monitor and secure a Windows 10 environment? Yeah, 
So native capability out of the box, not doing anything fancy, not installing any bloated endpoints, nothing. And finally, how do you recover from an intrusion, right? Let's say for a second you've gone through the pain of going and configuring a fully secure Windows 10 environment to the best of your abilities. If it does get compromised, what do you do? Yeah. What this talk is not about, and this is my disclaimer, it is not a silver bullet. We're not going to solve all the security problems. Right? It is not going to be an impediment to a committed adversary. And what I mean by that is, if you have information that is valuable, and you have an adversary that is committed to getting that information, there is nothing you can do to stop them. If you've been following the news that came out this evening from Bloomberg around the chip, you will understand what a committed adversary looks like. And a defense model, really. So this defense model is not ones and zeros, right? You cannot do bits and parts of this and say you're done. You either do all of it or you do none of it, right? You can't do in between. Why? Because we like to play games, right? I would like to see a defender, as a defender, an attacker come in and try and sweep my network, right? What is my objective? I would like to see them. That's essentially my objective, right? I detect early, I respond effectively. That's the end goal, right? So, adversary behavior, kill chain, right? Why is this relevant? So, before the Lockheed Martin kill chain, and everyone is aware of why Lockheed designed the kill chain, right? It was back in 2001. There was an intrusion. They decided to do something about it. They wanted a scientific approach to mapping out adversary behavior, and they wrote the kill chain, right? And that was a repeatable sequence of trying to say, this is what an adversary will do from the moment they step in to the moment they have compromised your network. Yeah? That was a kill chain. What's the next one? Pre-attack, right? So the MITRE attack framework, if you've not already seen it, is, is done by a research body out of Boston. They're called MITRE, and they named it their framework called attack. They also came up with something called pre-attack. Pre-attack is essentially the sequence of steps that are taken before an adversary decides to infiltrate your network, right? And what do those sequence of events look like, right? So, you're trying to identify, are you being targeted, number one, right? Is an adversary coming after you? So what are those signs? What commonly used techniques will the adversary use against you if they do decide to come after you, right? And what you should be doing in terms of your threat intelligence to try and identify that an adversary has now started targeting you, yeah? So these are sort of the signs that you want to look for. Okay. So there's 15 tactics and 151 techniques. They go into significant detail. I'm not going to go through all of them here. There's a link up there. Please, after you find time, go and read it, right? Um, what are they essentially, right? So, so an adversary has to decide how they will deliver a payload to you. Right. how they will infiltrate your network. They will try to scan your network space and identify, really, is there an exposed endpoint that I can start to target? What will be my first vector to enter inside that network? Once I have entered inside that network, how will I deliver my payload? Once I deliver my payload, how will I execute it? And once I've executed that payload, how will I exfiltrate that data, right? So they're trying to map out and find out, as an example, do you allow SMB to the internet? Do you allow HTTP? SMB to the internet? Do you allow WebDAV as an example? Do you allow RPC out? Do you allow um, DNS out? So on and so forth, right? And this is all typical adversary behavior to try and see what can they do to go undetected throughout your network. So that's pre-attack. So classified again, it's just recon. How do they weaponize and how do they deliver, right? This is all pre then comes the actual attack, right? So attack is adversarial tactics, techniques, and common knowledge. I really like this framework because this has sort of given me a framework, as you say, that is repeatable, right? Which means I can now start to say, if an attacker does this, this is what the defense model should look like. 
right? And these techniques, per se, are consistent in a Windows environment. So the attack framework is not just for Windows, it's for Linux, it's for Mac OS X. And if you go down the path of securing any environment of any size, you want a mechanism to be able to tell you, really, what does the attack surface look like, right? What techniques exist for which I need to build a defense mechanism? And that's what this does for you, right? So you're looking at initial access, you're looking at execution, persistence, privilege escalation, credential access, and then discovery. And you want to go through all of these sequence to build defenses against them. And that's the, that's the link. You will find these um, techniques in detail there as well. Okay, so what, what are we really trying to do? We're trying to summarize attacker behavior. We want to know when they're coming. You want to see them when they're on your network, right? You want to restrict them to specific parts of your network and you want to be able to control them. You want to map their activities. What does mapping activities mean? You want to start breaking it down to see at what part of the kill chain are they currently operating in, right? If you see an adversary who's already progressed to C2, yes, jump to mitigation. But if you see somebody who's performing recon in your network, don't go around blocking firewall rules immediately, right? And we'll talk a little bit about why. So, a little bit of psychology behind this, right? What, what is the relevance of intrusions and attacker costs, right? So there was a little bit of a study done. Um, it is important for us because we want, to, we want to be able to understand and attribute what the intent of the attacker is and how they will react once they enter our network, right? And there was this, there's this paper from 1985, the link is there. Um, what it said is attribution of intent to the attacker and I'm reading this, and by self-presentation to the attacker and the experimenter, retaliation varies. What they're trying to say is, let's say APT123, right? And APT123 will react differently if it enters a network belonging to A versus belonging to B. And why they do that is they're trying to find out if they've benchmarked network A to be at a certain security level and network B to be at a certain security level, the same attacker is going to behave completely differently on that network. And that's important. And so, I, so this is the abstract, but I'll read the highlighted part out, right? So, so there, was, there was a study done. There were 62 Japanese females who were all given electric shock. Okay? Go with it for a second. And they were given an electric shock after a question was asked to them. And what they were trying to determine is how will the person receiving the shock react differently if or not they knew the right answer, right? So the highlighted bit here is the results indicated that the subject showed more intense aggression against an opponent who already had an aggressive intent than one who did not, regardless of the actual level of the shock intensity. Right? There's a little bit of psychology behind this, and why they're saying this is, if somebody feels threatened on your network, they're going to react completely different whether or not you're actually going to do something about them. Yeah? So try and map this out into the cyberspace. So that's why attacker intent and an attacker's understanding of the outcome is important for us. Okay. And so, if an attacker perceives you as hostile, if an attacker feels that they have been detected and they might be kicked out, they will react completely differently. So what is our end goal? As a defender, my end goal is to track the attacker without letting them know that they have been picked up and without trying to jump to remediation. And why is that important? Let's say, you detected an attacker, he's still in the recon phase, and you say, oh, I see an IP address from China on my network that's going out to another IP address in South Africa, block the firewalls. You're gonna fall flat, right? And most people jump to that conclusion because they're trying to protect data. What's the problem with that approach? You fail to do scoping, You've not identified what the scope of the incident is. You fail to determine how far the attacker has gotten to your network. And you've also not tried to find out what the attacker already has and has not, right? 
What is even more important is you have not found out what the intent of the attacker was. Right? At the end of the day, when you are protecting information, you know what your information is worth. You know where your crown jewels are. Hopefully you do. Right? And if an attacker lands onto your network and you've not been able to identify why he was there or she was there, that's part of the problem. <laughs> okay. So, let's get serious, right? How do you make intrusions cost prohibitive? What is the end goal, right? You ring fence attackers. If an attacker shows up on your network, maybe give them a little bit of a honey network to play around with. You want to be able to track their activities. You want to be able to detect early. That is key, absolutely. If you're not spending money and time on content engineering, that is the number one thing you should be doing. If you go and invest a million dollars in a SOC, or you go and buy a nice shiny seam, and you have no one writing use cases that are relevant to your line of business or to your company, you're not making use of that investment, right? So detect early is absolutely key. How do you remediate swiftly? Okay, you found an attacker, an alarm goes off, somebody's gonna look at it at eight o'clock in the morning tomorrow. You don't remediate after 12 hours, you remediate then. You get an alarm, you go investigate it, right? So if those alarms are firing and people are not reading them, you're missing the boat. Then do a little bit of triple Ds, right? So deceive, disrupt, and deteriorate. What do I mean by this? So Nickel gave a nice talk about honey tokens in the AD environment. It's not bad to do a little bit of deception, right? You want to be able to give a sense of achievement to the attacker. They should feel, oh, I've compromised an account. Oh, I have an account which will allow me to escalate a privilege to another level. And that's important because you want to be able to do that. You also want the attacker to feel that they're on a network which is, which is having a few services exposed, right? You want the attacker to think, ah, oh, there's an SMB endpoint there. Ah, oh, there's an FTP endpoint there. Oh, there's a few telnet ports open to the internet. Let me go and see what's on them, right? So give the attacker enough time to go and do a little bit of playing around on your network. You also want to be able to disrupt them when you want. What does that mean, right? If you run any kind of darknet on your network, what is a darknet, right? So you, let's say you have an IP address space that is a slash 24 network. You have 200, 300 hosts on your network, right? So you create two classes of subnets. Create a third class of subnet, and on that subnet place nothing, right? You can go and place a few decoy hosts, that's the end of it, right? And then sit and collect net flow from all of these networks. That network should, that black net should, that dark net should never see any traffic. But if it does, you want to go and investigate how somebody laterally moved from one or two of the primary subnets onto the third subnet. And when they do, go switch it off. See what happens. You can afford to disrupt a non-production darknet more easily than going and disrupting a part of your development network, as an example, right? So disrupt them, and then deteriorate their service as well. So let's say an attacker is now on your network. He is on the darknet. He's found a few files, which he thinks are of value. Now he tries to exfil them, yeah? You're talking about a 100, 200 meg file? Let him try and exfiltrate that data. Give him a way out. The moment the data starts to leave your network, start to drop a packet or two. Corrupt the file before it reaches the adversary. Let him come back and try again. And these are things you can do today, right? So these are, these are ways you start to make it more expensive. The attacker's gonna go and sit and scratch his head and say, oh, what's going on? Let me go and try again. So, Windows 10. Windows has, uh, has been evolving significantly, and I really mean this because if you've not seen the Windows 10 security space, I highly recommend you go and have a look at it, right? And that was, that was my kickstart for all of this investigation around how to secure an environment within Windows. So back to Windows 7, I spoke about this earlier. You would have an AV agent, you would have an EDR agent, um, you would have a telemetry agent like a CCM running. You would have a number of other services which were trying to offer you a point solution for a bind problem, right? And as we internally decided to move from Windows 7 to Windows 10, we really said, 
what has Windows 10 evolved to, right? I don't want to go down the path of installing McAfee antivirus, or I shouldn't say McAfee, I shouldn't install any antivirus on my Windows 10 machine if I really don't have to, right? And that started the process of looking at Windows 10 security natively. So that's what we did. Um, Windows 10 security, and, and they change this very regularly, right? So, so the last update is from 17th of September. They had, they had about a dozen different blocks. They brought it down to three blocks. I'm going to read a little bit of this stuff. So there's identity protection, which is essentially credential guard and remote credential guard. There's information protection, which is BitLocker, the DMA protection, the Windows information protection, the secure boot, and there's the TPM modules. And then there's threat protection, which is WDATP. And WDATP now has ASR, the EDR product, hunting, and AIRS. Uh, AIRS was the uh, incident response. And then smart screen, which was essentially device guard and, and the um, kernel protection. So what are these things, right? So credential guard, Mimi cats. Everyone knows about it, right? You have secrets in memory. You have cached credentials. You have any of that stuff on your network. You're running NTLM1, NTLM v 2 They will find it. And that is the lowest bar to their entry. If somebody's able to execute Mimikatz on your network, that's fine. What they extract out of it makes the difference. That's where credential guard comes in. So secrets in memory are typically managed by the LSAS process, right? And that's how Windows traditionally operated. So they went and created this isolated LSAS. What it meant was that secrets in the LSAS were again isolated in a different part of memory, like a Hyper-V hypervisor. And what they did with that is they said, hey, if your credentials or your secrets in memory are stored in inside this isolated LSAS, if somebody does a credential dumping on this host, they're not going to be able to access this, right? So hold that thought for a second. It was a good implementation, right? So CredGuard worked quite well for a while, and then Benjamin Delphi said, huh, not so much fun, right? And so there's mitigations around it, right? So CredGuard essentially does isolation of secrets in memory, and then we'll come to that in a second. The second bit around CredGuard was remote credential guard. Why is remote credential guard important? You do RDP to a machine. The remote machine gives you a prompt and says, enter your password, right? You provide a password, it's sent back to the machine you were trying to connect to. That machine then validates it against its own AD and then provides your response. Hey, you're right, your password is correct, you're part of the right remote admin group, here you can have access to the host. That was the problem statement. What Remote Credential Guard did is essentially say, hey, I'm trying to RDP into this machine, authenticate to me, right? And the machine would send back a request to you to say, hey, I see you're part of the same domain. Why don't you authenticate yourself to the local AD and then provide a token back to me? And so what Remote Credential Guard did is it allowed you not to send secrets over the wire, right? That's what Remote Credential Guard did. Um, but again, the problem with this was you cannot defend against something like this if really there are existing stored credentials on the local host. So as an example, you are a remote admin. You are allowed to do MSTSC into a local, into a remote host. You are now protecting your credentials. But if there's a service running on that local machine that you're already trying to RDP into and that has secrets in memory, you can't defend against it, right? So that's what Remote Credit Guard did. So let's talk a little bit about the credit card, right? And I wanted this to be a demo, but I really don't want to upset the demo guard. So, so here is what a machine looks like. And let me see if I can zoom into some of the stuff. Can you see it already? So let me, let me try and point it out, right? So, so you have two machines here. This is, this is the machine that's already running CredGuard. This is a machine that's not running CredGuard. How do you know? Because if you do privilege debug on this machine, you get a bunch of stuff, but look what's missing on this part versus look what's available on this part, right? So you have the NTLM, you have the SHA-1 hashes available, and you also have the W digest values here, right? You don't see them on this side. Why is this relevant? Because if you do CredGuard implementations properly, the secrets disappear from memory, right? So you don't have your NTLM and SHA-1 hashes anymore, and hence you don't get those values when you run Mimikatz. 
but there's bypasses, right? And this is the one I was talking about, right? So, so when CredGuard came out, the founder of Miming Cats said, huh, there might be a bypass to it. And let me explain what he said, right, before we jump, jump into the demo. The logic behind it is quite simple. You have isolated processes in memory, and then you have the LSS process that sits outside in the local system. Traditional processes, so if you're going and installing a program, you run an MSI file as an example, that MSI file is not running inside an isolated process. It's running on the local system. So it makes a call to the local LSAS. The LSAS is going to make a call to the isolated LSAS, and hence that's how a chain is established. So let's look at this. So he's looking at a file called mimilsa.log. There's nothing in there. Okay, he runs the privilege debug command. He gets a response saying, okay. He tries to look at the log on passwords. There's a bunch of things fired. He really doesn't see the NTLM hashes. He doesn't see the SHA-1 hashes. There's the UN key keys, so on and so forth, All right? Goes back to the other machine, looks at the version. It's a Windows NT. A secure kernel is running. Credential Guard is also running on this machine, right? And then he injects the MSSP. MSSP. And what's happened now is he's injected a process. It's running from the local system as the locally running user. He waits for the user to log off and log back in or start a program with his access. When he logs back in, a local log file is created on that system, which contains all the passwords. What just happened here, right? So what's happened here is that somebody moved secrets in memory from an MSI file that was supposed to be running. Somebody injected code into that MSI file. When it ran, it called the isolated LSAS, pulled the secrets from there, dumped it to a local text file. And that's how this attack works, right? Can you do something about it? Sure. So for every action, there's a reaction as well. And here's what a defender would do. Fine, somebody's exploited this vulnerability. This has happened. What can you do to defend against it? Number one, you can go and disable the debug privilege for your administrators. It might be OK. It might not be OK in some environments. You can detect registry changes. So if somebody goes and modifies a key that allows you to change the W digest values from disabled to enabled, maybe pick up and, and trigger an alarm. You do not permit cache credentials to be stored. So by default, when you build your machines, make sure that that key is disabled. Or you can do what Nikhil Mithil does and says, use honey tokens. And why is this important, right? Let's say there is a secret in memory that was picked up as a result of a cred SSP attack or a mem SSP attack. That's fine. You want the attacker to pick it up, and then you want the attacker to use it. But you better make sure that your seam knows that a use case should alert every time an account, which was a honey token, was used anywhere on your network, no matter if the machine is on-prem or off-prem. And some memes, right? Why honey tokens? You present an attacker. Oh, he thinks he's found a honey token. That's good. But there's more, right? And that's what you're trying to do. You're deceiving the attacker from going and finding the real success factors, right? That's, that's how it is. Information protection. And information protection has a lot of things. So jumping now into information protection, I will talk only about device health attestation. Why is this important? So device health attestation is, is relevant because you are then trying to protect your organization from credential leakage, right? So let's say something happens, traditional phishing attack, somebody goes online, puts the username, password, you have two-factor authentication available, the guy clicks on a phishing link, puts the password, and you're done, right? You now want to be able to detect if somebody is trying to reuse a credential off your network. Irrespective of whether you have two-factor authentication or not, it's not relevant here. Why? Because there are traditional services that don't use two-factor authentication. So if you run Exchange within your environment, as an example, you have legacy auth and you have modern auth. Modern auth supports two-factor authentication, but you have Active Sync, you have Exchange web services running. All of those don't really use two-factor authentication. 
So a reused credential is still valid. If, I know Etienne is here, who used to work for SensePost. So Etienne Staldrad, and I'm pronouncing his name, murdering it, but he wrote a tool called Ruler. Yeah, if, if you've heard of it, has anyone heard of it before? No, yeah. So that tool is important, why? Because it weighs in on an adversary trying to go and create a malicious outlook rule. Why is it important? Right, so I gave you the example of the phishing incident. You send a blast of phishing emails, right? And you expect that if your organization has 100,000 people, one out of those 100,000 will click on it, yeah? You wait for the guy to click on it or a girl to click on it, put their password in. The attacker then takes the password that they've recovered and queries the auto-discover URL for your exchange. From that, he finds what the EWS node is. He then tries to log in to the Exchange Web Services and says, with the ruler tool, hey, can you show me now with this mappy endpoint exposed, what can I do on this Exchange mailbox? He says, oh, you can read emails if you want. So he says, great. Then what the tool does, says, okay, can you show me how many Outlook rules does the person have already? He says, yeah, here you go. He has 40 rules. Okay, then the tool says, right. Let's go in, and I don't have a video for this, unfortunately. It's very interesting, but you should see it. So what the tool does and says, okay, let me go and create a new Outlook rule. And all that Outlook rule is supposed to do is say, anytime an email comes in, which says pop, as an example, I'm making up a word, go and execute the script. What is that script? That script could be hosted on a web dev directory somewhere. Doesn't matter what it is. Every time an email will come in that has the word pop, go execute the script. That's it. Yeah? He saves the rule, that's it. He's now waiting for the user to come into his office, open his Outlook client, and he just waits, right? This is now something that's waiting in hiding, right? So there is some sort of a persistence mechanism, but it's not really established persistence, but he has a leg into the door. On one fine day, he sends an email to the, to the user with the word pop. The user sees it. Who is this guy who's sending me an email with the word pop? He has absolutely no idea what it is. A few minutes later, the email disappears. What's happened, right? His Outlook client has interpreted the email coming in, has tagged it to the Outlook rule. The Outlook rule has said, ah, pop, go and execute this code from, from web dev. And what has happened after that is that it's established a bunch of persistence, it's downloaded a bunch of things, and now he's sitting on your local machine. What does the attacker do? Empire shell, reverse payload. He sees it coming and he says, ah, I have access inside the network. It started from a phishing email. All the user had to do was enter username and password. Even better, the attacker goes in and says, ah, I have a reverse payload. The dropper has established. Let me go push more heavy code into that machine. Oh, and by the way, while I'm at it, let me go back to the mappy endpoint and delete the rule I created and delete the email that came in. Good luck as a defender going and trying and finding that. It is next to impossible for you to go and find out one rule that is created in one Outlook mailbox somewhere in your company without knowing what the attacker did. Extremely difficult. But it does become important because you then want to be able to stop the attacker from doing more with that credential. Right? So this is what it is. So before Windows 10, um, there was no concept of device health attestation, right? So if you compromised a username or a password, it was an assumed breach. That was the end of it, right? So somebody had a username password, they would log into your SharePoint online, they would log into your OneDrive, they would pick out files, and that was the end of it. So with device health attestation, what happens is you can configure trust to be established on a username password plus the health of a device that you control. What does that mean, right? So somebody goes and compromises an account, username password is lost, he now tries to use the username and password to access SharePoint Online. What does SharePoint Online say? Hey, you're coming in from ABC Corp. I know your company uses DHA. If you are coming in from a registered asset, can you please go to my cloud broker and verify the integrity of your asset, okay? So what the device is supposed to do, when it receives an instruction of this sort, it's supposed to go out, connect to a DHA, a device health attestation cloud. This is free of cost. There's no cost to it. 
it verifies parameters. And you can decide what parameters it wants to verify. You can say, tell me the list of installed programs. Tell me if early launch anti-malware as a driver is enabled. Tell me if the machine has pinged the Active Directory in the last seven days, and so on and so forth, right? And what that starts to do is it starts to say, hey, if you've compromised a username and password, you better have a corporate build that has a valid currency, which means it's current in the Active Directory. The certificates are valid, and you must have a mechanism to be able to get those keys from the local CA on the network, right? So which means you have shifted the responsibility of trying to verify the username and password onto verifying the username password plus the device the user is coming from, right? That's now an additional threshold for the attacker to reach your network, right? So if they want to compromise your network, they don't just need to do phishing, they also need to be able to get access to your IT stores, get a legitimate copy of your Windows build, they need to be able to find an asset that they need to steal of somebody who's traveling somewhere to make sure that they can then reuse that credential to access your network. That's what device health attestation did. So I spoke about this, so it's early boot vulnerabilities, you're trying to mitigate that. Um, you are also trying to mitigate secure boot tampering, right? So UFE versus BIOS, you want to be able to detect if somebody has injected rootkits into your machine. So what it does is it says, signed boot process, somebody modifies my boot process, alarm, my boot has been tampered with, the device health attestation flag gets set, and it says, oops, the machine integrity has been lost, call your security teams, ask them to investigate you. Yeah? So they, that machine can then no longer be used on your corporate network if you have DHA enabled. And these are the things that I spoke about, right? So it checks if the BitLocker status is enabled, secure boot is enabled, Elam driver. Now Elam driver, if, has anyone heard of Elam? Okay, so Elam is early launch anti-malware. And what Microsoft did is it gave OEM vendors, antivirus vendors, it gave security vendors an option to be able to call into the Windows kernel and say, hey, if you are detecting or if you're writing any kind of pre-boot driver, right, before the operating system loads, I would now be, I would now like to be able to determine if any DLL, any driver has loaded prior to the launch of the OS that is not signed by Microsoft and be able to verify the integrities of those drivers, right? That's essentially how rootkits operate. So for me to be able to have a kernel implant, I should be able to start a driver before the operating system boots up. Elam allows you to verify the integrity of those drivers or the boot process before the OS gets booted. So that's what Elam does. Then comes the last bit around ASR, right? So threat protection has did I miss a slide? Yeah. So there's other bits around, around uh, threat protection. So threat protection has primarily Windows Defender ATP, and they've started to consolidate a bunch of features under, under Windows Defender ATP. So what is ASR? ASR is attack surface reduction. You can decide to implement a set of rules, and those rules say, hey, if X conditions are mapped on my network or on my host, react differently. And you, set to, you, you can set and allow, as an example, what you do with Office, what you do with files, when files are copied versus when files are moved from USB, so on and so forth, right? So there's a bunch of features there. So there's hardware isolation, application control, exploit protection, network protection, controlled folder access, ASR itself, and then the network rules, right? We'll talk a little bit about what ASR is. So you can write ASR rules for office, for files, for network movement, for firewall configurations, so on and so forth. So let's go through a few of them, right? How does an attack actually look like? Somebody sends you a Word file, as an attachment says, absolutely important. Can you look at it right away? Okay, what does the word file do? It says, enable macro to be able to view the contents of this file. Sure, enable macro. What has happened? Word has now created a sub-process that is beaconing out to the attacker. As an example, right, I'm making this up. So an attacker sends you a file that has that has a macro in it. The macro's only job is, if gets enabled, go and call this version of code out. You want to be able to detect if msword.exe has a child process created. And that child process is beaconing out to the internet. That's one. 
you want to be able to be to stop somebody from injecting into um, into the word process, right? So everyone is aware of of what the doppelganger uh, process injection attack was. Somebody goes and looks at MS Word.exe, or even better, looks at ah. Carbon Black allows MS Word.exe to run. I now want to be able to inject into MS Word.exe and run my own version of malicious code. So you can detect that, or you can prevent that, actually. Um, script rules. If, so if, if you detect any kind of JavaScript, shell script, PowerShell script, running on your local host, and that has any kind of obfuscation in it, right? If you saw Daniel Bohannon's talk today, Anyone doing any kind of obfuscation in any script can be blocked by a simple configuration on ASR. Yeah. Email rules, I spoke about this. There's a very simple flag. If you see an email when it comes in and the email contains an attachment, the moment that attachment is saved to your local system, it has a tiny flag set that says, file originated from the internet. It's as simple as that. You can then decide what happens with that file once it's on your local host. Can it execute? If it does execute, it executes inside a Hyper-V container, or is it allowed to call out to the internet, so on and so forth, or completely stop it from executing. And file is what I spoke about, right? So you have a file sitting on a USB, somebody plugs it in, auto run, runs, and then says, okay, if auto run is allowed to run from an untrusted USB, is it allowed to execute any, co any code within the constraints of the user mode? The answer is yes or no. So these are sort of things that you can do with ASR rules. They fall under the exploit prevention umbrella. It's also important because most of the attacks are going away from file-based attacks to fileless attacks. Right? It's the stuff that's happening in memory. You want to be able to detect it and react to it quite quickly. So the example of Word, child process being created in memory, nothing is on disk. Communication comes in, macro executes, all of that can be prevented through ASR. Yeah, so I don't have much on this except maybe I'll show you a demo around it. So Windows Defender ATP um, was Microsoft's answer to, to the aging Windows Defender technology, right? And Windows Defender was traditionally antivirus product. So what it would do is it would receive updates in the form of patch updates. So when Windows software would be updated, they would also send a malware removal package, right? And Windows Defender would take that update and say, huh, I scanned the local system. There's potentially unwanted software. Let me go remove it. That was Defender back in the days. And so Microsoft said, okay, let's do something about the EPP space. So the endpoint protection stack, and they said, okay, the endpoint protection stack is starting to age. They rewrote Defender with Defender ATP. And what Defender ATP does in Windows 10, and now it's backported to Windows 7 as well, or Windows 7 and 8, it allows you to consume the telemetry data that Windows is sending out. So if, if you look at Windows 10, Windows 10 has full telemetry, basic telemetry enabled. You can decide how much information you send to the cloud, right? And this is the Microsoft Cloud. When you enable basic telemetry or full telemetry, you're sending some amount of information such as running processes, how many applications are installed, the users who are logged in, so on and so forth. Windows Defender ATP, on the other hand, if you enable that, it sends all of this information into the Microsoft Cloud. Okay, so you might ask, why do I want to send all this information to Microsoft? Okay, you could decide to write a kernel implant yourself. You can decide to make every single Windows subsystem API call, map it out, identify when a use case is being triggered, or you can decide to go and build your own next-gen EDR solution, right? Or you can probably leverage the work that somebody else has done and use that, right? So for us, when we looked at Windows Defender ATP, we said, okay, you know, the, the entry barrier is quite high. We don't have skills to write kernel implants. We don't have skills to go out and procure an EDR solution that's gonna sit on top of another EPP solution and we're gonna go back to the Windows 7 days. And so we took a bet. So we went down the path of looking at Windows Defender ATP. So we'll talk a little bit about what Windows Defender ATP does, but essentially the kernel implant tracks every single call is made and then writes a log, and then that log is compared against the things, against a set of things that are good or bad. So this is what it looks like, right? So if you have the entry space here, 
Um, that entry space could be anything, right? So you could have your supply chain, you could have web, you could have email, USB, network traffic, and then storage. And Windows Defender ATP looks at all of the stack and says what you can do against it. So that's where the ASR rules come in. That's where smart screen and network protection comes in. Smart screen is essentially the first time your machine makes a call out to an IP address or to a URL on the internet, it validates it against a list of good versus bad, as simple as that. Yeah, uh, Email is Office 365 and the built-in capabilities. We'll talk a little bit about that. USB control is quite simple, so on and so forth. And this is where the Windows Defender stack is essentially. So pre-run, before the file executes on your host, there's a bunch of things you can do. And then this is where the runtime stack is. So known behaviors, proactive behavior scans, anti-rootkit, uh, behavior sh shielding, which is ASR, and then behavior recording, which is, which is FDR, right? These are essentially components of the EDR stack. Advanced hunting. This is the other component which they baked in to Windows Defender ATP. Why is this relevant? So all this telemetry information that is going out to the cloud, it's based on, on the premise that, hey, Microsoft is going to write a nice shiny rule that is going to pick up APT123 the moment it comes out. Yeah? What if Microsoft only came to know about it six months after you've already known about it? Yeah? And that happens, right? So if you do any kind of defense, you have TLP red information available to you. You have TLP amber information available to you. TLP is traffic light protocol. It essentially is you having certain amount of intelligence which nobody else does. And that might be because you're in a particular vertical. It's because you have received direct intelligence out of a government body, so on and so forth. Or you're sharing information in some sort of an ISAC. This is where advanced hunting comes in, right? So advanced hunting says, hey, here is a bunch of information schema components that you can query. You can look at network, you can look at file, you can look at registry, you can look at process events. And that schema, once exposed, allows it to be queried based on rules that you write. And we'll talk a little bit about what those rules will look like, but it essentially an advanced hunting rule can say, hey, if a process gets created in C colon slash dub dub dub, and that process name is called inetpub.exe and has a hash of x and communicates to an IP address 1.2.3.4, trigger an alert for the SOC to go and pick it up. That's called an advanced hunting rule. And that is unique to your organization. It is unique to your work environment. And that advanced hunting rule can be timed. So you can say as an example, hey, this machine is not online right now. So of my 300 machines on the local network, I have 150 machines online. If those machines start to come online in a different time zone, make sure the rule runs every 15 minutes so that every machine that comes online gets that rule fired, right? That's how you schedule those queries out. So that's possible again with advanced hunting rules. And then comes the AIRS, right? So AIRS was essentially an acquisition that Microsoft did, I think about two years ago from a company called Hexadite. And AIRS is, is Microsoft's answer to automated response. Why is this relevant to you, right? So if you run a SOC today, um, your analysts are going to be burdened by the amount of information that's getting thrown at them through the various sensors, right? And your analysts will experience what we call alert fatigue. Alert fatigue is essentially saying, hey, I've told my users a million times not to go and plug in a USB that is found in a parking lot, but they still do it, right? Now I need to go and triage that incident. I need to go and deal with that incident. What AIRS allows you to do is run a generic playbook, which essentially says, hey, if you see it, a thing happening on a local machine, and that thing looks like X, go and do Y automatically. And that Y could be as simple as, hey, kill this process, or hey, quarantine this machine, make sure it doesn't communicate to anything else, and once the machine has been quarantined, go and do ABC. Right? That's traditionally what playbooks are about. So that's what AIRS does out of the box today. The only caveat to that is it needs Windows 10 version 1803 and later, so that's about two versions now last two versions. And now we're getting to the serious stuff, right? On threat protection, there's a, there's a concept called device guard. What is device guard? Right? Device guard was Microsoft's answer to provide detailed security for an asset that was meant to be run only in lockdown mode. Okay? What does that mean? It means you define what applications run, 
You define how those applications run. You define where those applications can run in memory and what parts of the memory they can access. You define what the trusted boot process should look like for those machines. And after you've done all of that stuff, you go and sign the boot process with the key. And that key exists within your environment. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to lock down a machine to a specific set of objectives. What could that machine be? So as simple as a machine that does printing of tickets at a kiosk, right? Its only job is to run one binary. It's not supposed to open office files. It's not supposed to connect to the internet. It's not supposed to scan for DNS traffic on the local network. It's not supposed to do any of that stuff. It runs a program, that a program takes input via the screen, prints a receipt via the printer, that's it. And to be able to lock a machine down is how you use device guard. So you can go and specify what that does. I'll read a little bit of these slides because I might not be able to say it in the same way as, as they do on the, on the documentation, but what they're saying here is it's configurable code and integrity, so which means you verify the integrity of the boot process before the OS is even booted. That's important. It covers the code running in user mode, kernel mode, including hardware and software drivers, including those that run as part of Windows. What that means is you are able to assure the integrity of the asset right from pre-boot until post-boot. Remember, anything that is pre-boot is, is kernel implant, right? Is driver-based. To be able to assure the integrity of that asset, including if somebody tampers with the hardware and installs an additional microchip on that key, on that motherboard, yeah, if that hardware changes in any shape or form, the integrity of that asset is lost. You also protect it from somebody getting local admin access on your local machine and modifying the code integrity policy. Once the code integrity policy has been defined and signed, you would have to modify it resign it from your local CS server, and then be able to do anything with it. And last but not least is HVCI, right? And HVCI is you want to be able to you want to be able to protect a system from any kind of attack that occurs pre-OS boot, right? So if an attacker has modified a system pre-OS boot, there is no way for the operating system to be able to detect it, and hence any of the protection mechanisms on the local system can be enabled or disabled by this pre-OS boot uh, malicious process. That's where it gets serious, right? This is a fully locked down state of a Windows machine that an attacker cannot compromise. Till date, there has been no way to compromise a machine that is fully locked down with device guard. And I see why this is important. It is important because people are experimenting with this concept. There are users, and fairly well-known in the field, right? So Manifestation, if you follow him on Twitter, came out and said, hey, I am now implementing a fully locked down asset, which has absolutely nothing running in terms of security, except a device guard policy, which is properly implemented. And it is important because that shows the amount of trust that exists in a machine that has been fully locked down correctly with Windows, right? And so device guard is, is my answer, hopefully, to a lot of the other problems. We'll quickly go through this because we have about 10 minutes left. So Windows 10 telemetry data does a bunch of things. There's privacy, uh, there's privacy considerations around it. When it does it, it sends a bunch of information to the cloud, and that cloud information can or cannot be used in a specific way, right? So that's that. Now this is, this is what advanced hunting is about. So I told you about the schema. Now the schema exposed is this. It says alert events, process creation events, network communication events, file creation events, registry events, log on, image load, and miscellaneous events. This schema is exposed by Microsoft Windows natively if you run Defender ATP. You can then write your own advanced hunting rules. So let's take this example. Somebody wants to be able to use accessibility features, so SetHC, Taskman, any of those old, old school attacks. You write a simple advanced hunting rule, and this is again based on the MITRE framework, right? So remember we said at the start, we want a mechanism to be able to build our defenses that are repeatable, right? So you look at the MITRE attack framework, you identify what the attack scenarios in a Windows system should look like, you identify accessibility feature misuse, and then you go and write a hunt rule against it, right? So this is what it is. It essentially says, look at all events, registry events, that occurred one hour ago, and identify if registry key contains image file execution options, right? 
So you're hoping that an attacker would have gone and modified registry entry. And that registry entry was image file execution options. And with that, go and project all of this information. That's, that's essentially what advanced hunting rules will do. You can do the same for app cert. I'm going to run through this very quickly. You can do it for privilege escalation. And then there's, there's more scripts here, right? So I'll, I'll release the scripts, uh, release the slides right after this talk, so you can go pick it up. There's a bunch of other use cases that we've also open sourced. There's a bunch of other very intelligent people who are working on this. So there's scripts that you can go and run as an example to detect if uh, cert util decode is being running in app data, so on and so forth. And this was the AIRS module that I showed you a little bit earlier, right? So PowerShell dropped a suspicious file on the machine. You want to be able to automatically triage it. It says, hey, I see a file that's run here. And you can go and say, the recommended step is quarantine the machine and go and try and quarantine the file, right? And the machine is fully remediated if it works correctly, so on and so forth. So what have we done, right? We're trying to disrupt the attacker. We're trying to set an entry barrier that is high enough to demotivate the attacker on your network. You have prevented third-party code from running natively, and the attempt to inject code into a process has been detected. Attempts to run in memory have been detected. All registry network file process creation events can be queried now. The same state of security applies to assets that are on campus versus off campus. My asset that is traveling here today has no relation to an asset that's sitting on the local corporate network. The same amount of security applies no, ma no matter where it is. And hosts are hardened pre-boot, which means early boot tampering, et cetera, so on and so forth are not possible. So what? Nothing. The attack cost has gone up. That means they cannot run generic run-of-the-mill attacks against my assets anymore. The value of the objective, why they compromised my network in the first place, probably remains the same, but the return on investment has reduced because the cost has gone up. And defenders are at least in control and watching. So, is pure profit? Maybe not. At least the defenders have an opportunity now to level the playing field. The red teamers and the blue teamers are on the same playing field and say, if you do something, I will watch you. That's it from me. If you want to read a little bit more, there's more information on these slides. Please go and look it up. And questions? Thank you. Questions? Sorry. <clears throat> more of a comment than a question. <laughs> um, so MITRE ATT&CK also includes, th so they have Windows, Mac, Enterprise, Linux. They have mobile, and they're about to release ICS. Nice. Um, th that was one thing. And then the second thing was that, um, I forget the exact acronym, but that sort of uh, heuristic for hunting for one of the attack behaviors. Um, there is a group that's working to put together the, these type of, uh, let's say, analytics yeah. in pseudocode. Um, it's quasi-public. Are you familiar with? Uh, That's the Sigma project, I think. No, it's no? CAR. Uh, anyway, we okay. can talk about that offline, but you might want to get plugged yeah. in there. Okay. Yeah, so the Sigma project that you refer, so a different project which does something quite similar is, is Florian Roth's Sigma project. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to write hunting code in a generic language that is not applied to Splunk, does not apply to McAfee Foundstone, doesn't apply to any platform as such. It's essentially saying, hey, if you want to detect X, here's what you need to do Y. But yeah. Somebody else? No? OK. Then. No. Thank you very much. Thanks.